Our uh, featured speaker today is uh, D. Rashawn Gilmore. Uh, he is a uh, serial entrepreneur. He started his first successful business as a tea in a bakery. Uh, since then, he's been, uh, like I said, started, started and sold several successful businesses. He's currently a project manager for uh, Project I Am for the Kansas City Care Clinic and uh, a Promo Senior Field Advisor for Promo. Uh, if you could please give him a warm welcome. He was Sean Gilbert. Good morning. Am I too loud? You guys can hear me okay? Great, fantastic. Uh, I am really just very honored to be here this morning, and I want to thank Helen, even though I know she's absent this morning, for being such a gracious hostess and getting this cell uh, set up for me. And to Galen, who has been texting with me all morning, making sure I had all the information I needed, I really appreciate him so much as well. And I should also thank, where is Josh? Hi. He's here somewhere. And uh, I want to thank Josh because he's the reason why I am here today. And uh, he invited me out. And I'm so very thankful and glad to be here. It's a Sunday morning. It's very cold. And yet you all came out to hear a little low me. So everybody's been saying this morning, we're so looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And I'm like, yeah, me too. Uh. <laughs> so if you'll be patient with me, we're going to go somewhere fun. And really, I uh, hope have a, an enjoyable time together this morning. So when I was first asked to, to speak, I gave the, uh, the talk title of Own the Pond. And it's something that I've been sort of living my life by for a long time. Now, most of us have heard the theory or the proverb that says, uh, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, he's for a lifetime. You can feed him for a lifetime. Well, I feel like dispense with all that. I want to own the pond and do what I want when I want to do it, right? And so I like to talk to people about building the kind of life that aligns with their purpose and being fulfilled in what they feel they're here to do. And I was so excited about that. It's a talk I give often. It's something, as I said, that I try to live by. Um, and I try to be one of those people who I don't really believe and practice what you preach. I don't believe in that at all, actually. I do not believe in practice what you preach. I believe in preach what you practice. Share with people what you know works and what you're applying to your own life. And that way you avoid hypocrisy and uh, it's a lot better that way. But today, uh, I'm actually not gonna talk about owning the pond. And I did not tell uh, Galen this, so if you see him with a big hook yanking me off the stage, you'll know why. Uh, but I do wanna tell you why I'm not gonna be talking about that today. Uh, and the reason is that in between the time, or from the time that I was asked to now, something uh, happened that has left a very indelible mark on my life. And I just feel like I should speak from the heart today about what that is. And hopefully you will allow me uh, the freedom to do that. And I know we're gonna have a little Q&A afterwards too, and uh, I'll try to answer your questions as best I can. But before I go into that and give you what my talk will be about today, I wanna tell you a little bit about myself. I am a Kansas City native, uh, born and raised, and I've lived in everywhere from Midtown Kansas City to North Kansas City, all the way out to the Raytown uh, area. And uh, my parents are very unique in that my mom was raised uh, sort of Baptist and then with her parents became uh, Muslim. Uh, and my dad and his entire family are all Catholics. So how a Catholic, and it sounds like a bad joke, right? <laughs> Probably got a Muslim walking to a bar. Uh, yet they found each other, they found, this is when I see a couple people like trying to do the math on them, like, how does that work? But my parents got together and they had four children, myself, I have two brothers, and we each have one sister, again, do the math. Uh, it's the same sister, folks. And growing up, I had a beautiful family. I always tell people that my family is the kind of family that if I said I was going to the moon, my mother would begin baking moon pies, my dad would be mixing rocket fuel in the garage, my brothers would be hammering out a, a ship for me, my grandmother sewing up moon boots, you know, that kind of thing. And I've always been very grateful for that. But one of the things that happened in my life that makes it really unique is that my Muslim mom and my Catholic dad, uh, you see, Catholics have this thing I've noticed about uh, not really minding uh, a little wine here and there. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or a lot sometimes, and my dad was on the lot side. And so my parents, after being married for 11 years and having four children, uh, decided that uh, it wasn't working. And so they separated and divorced. And so my parents uh, 
love us. They were always there for us, but for 70 years, they were apart. And then 25 years ago, last October, my parents remarried. And uh, they're part of 1% of the 51% who actually divorced, they got remarried. And uh, that's always been something in my life that's led me to believe in hope and possibility of change and growth in people. And that's kind of significant to today's talk because I'm a parent now, I have two children. I'm an adoptive parent, I have uh, a son Joseph, a daughter Sabrina, they're siblings, and I adopted them when I was quite young. Now I know you're thinking that I'm young and that's because it's true. Black don't crack and I'm perpetually 30. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Anybody else not real age, I'm, I'm turning over tables and chairs here, folks. But the reality of it is, I have learned and grown as a parent, I've learned and grown as an individual, and now I'm bringing all of that to the table today. So what do I want to talk about today? I want to talk about something greater than love. And I know a lot of times you think, well, what can be greater than love? I mean, how many of you believe, honestly, honestly, that if we would just learn to love one another, the world would be a better place, by show of hands. I mean, just love. Well, don't be ashamed, I saw somebody going, well, I guess so, no. <laughs> Wave your hand, if you believe love, and look around, look at all the waving hands. Love can change the world. But what if I told you as I am, I'm putting forth something greater than love? So, I told you that something happened to cause me to want to change my talk today, and it, it hit me in a way that I didn't expect it to. I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm a social justice activist. Uh, I may be like a Facebook activist, maybe. <laughs> you know, like, share, rant. I mean, you know, that kind of thing. But the reality of it is, there was a story of a young man, a little boy, actually, a little boy, who was killed. in a playground in Cleveland, Ohio, just over a year ago. He was outside playing by himself with his toy gun. And toy guns are really interesting for this time of year because we just passed the, you know, the Christmas holidays and everybody loves to watch the story of that Red Rider BB gun. And every little boy wants one, right? You're gonna put your eye out, mom says no. Right? A Christmas story? Sound familiar? This little boy, however, was outside playing in the park. His name is Tamir. Anybody heard of Tamir Rice? What an enlightened group you are. Tamir was playing in the park, and a neighbor, a concerned citizen, a watchful person, saw him in the park and decided to call 911 and said, hey, there's somebody in the park playing with a gun, or with a gun. It looks like a kid, maybe a toy, I'm not sure. And suddenly, two very august members of the Cleveland Police Department show up, barely managing to stop the vehicle because they didn't even put it in park. It rolled to the curb. And in less than two seconds, in, in less than two seconds, close your eyes for just a moment. One, two, open your eyes. That quickly, officers drew their guns, shot, and killed to be arrested, 12 years old. I had an opportunity to hear Dr. John Powell recently at the Coffin Foundation, and he is an expert in matters of race and, and racism, and I will tell you that I am not an expert in race or racism. I am, however, an expert in my experiences with race and racism. So that is the perspective from which I will be sharing again. I don't practice what I preach, I preach what I practice. So I'm telling you what I know. And while this is a heavy subject, a weighty subject, I would not have you leave here feeling unempowered to bring about any sort of change. Because again, we're talking about something greater than love. And for many of us, we cannot fathom something greater than love. What is greater than love that could have prevented Tamir Rice's death. Well, the reality of it is, we were having this conversation at the Coffin Foundation with Dr. Powell, and a lady got up at the end to, to ask a question. She said, I, I, I just don't get it. Why are black people so angry? 
and it was all I could do to prevent my eyeballs from rolling around in my head. <laughs> but I wasn't offended. I felt badly for her. Because ultimately it was a cry for, what can I do? I don't understand this. And so she said, if we would just love one another, we'll be fine. So I pose the question to you. Those of you who so vigorously waved your arms earlier when I said, who believes that love can change the world and cure what ails us as humanity? I'm curious, can love change us? I see a head, a head or two, I see several heads nodding. Okay, so let's get into it. What is greater than love? Dr. King, in one of his most famous quotes said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward, does anybody have enough? Justice. Something greater than love is justice. And I'll prove it. If you tell me that you love me, but you don't treat me equally or fairly, will I ever grow to love you? Are you really demonstrating love to me? But if you show me justice and you treat me equally, and I treat you equally and fairly, it's very likely that we'll come to say, you know what, we're different, but you're just as equal as I am. There's the groundwork for love, for justice, and that's where we have to get to. So a lot of times, like with that lady, she wanted to know, what can I do? How can I fix this? How can I change this? And I know it's hard for sometimes. You hear, some people hear black lives matter, and they interpret that as white lives don't. It's a bit like this. What if you went to the doctor and said, hey doc, I think I broke my arm. And uh, she says, okay, well tell me about it. Well, I broke my arm, everything else is feeling fine. And you say, but I'm, I'm certain that I broke my arm. And she goes, all bones matter. <laughs> uh, yeah, but right now, it's the broken one that I'm most concerned about. Is that okay with you? I mean, think about how silly that sounds. Black lives matter, white lives matter. Yeah, all lives matter. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, sure enough, sure do. No disagreement there. But what happens is that change that's coming about, and it's almost as if this, now this, is, now this, this, is, this might get to the heart of it, and some may not like hearing it, but part of it is this. One aspect of, of this is when you hear the term Black Lives Matter or when you realize that, that that lump in your throat, that discomfort, the knot in your stomach perhaps, sometimes that's just the response of white privilege learning to deal with what it means to confront or be faced with black power. And listen, black power, all Black Lives Matter, it's not about saying to white folks, you're a bad person, Kevin, and Lisa, you're awful, and Alex, you have no purpose being here. It's about saying, hey, we're here too. And part of, part of what I, I like to look at it as is this. I need you just as much as you need me. I have a, I'm gonna, I put this down, and I'm gonna share this with you guys, and hopefully it will, it will resonate. I was just scribbling some thoughts down, and I thought, you know, this hits where I am in life. A critical part of my worldview, worldview is that I believe that more for you does not mean less for me. I believe in abundance. I don't think that pulling up one community necessitates tearing down another. I don't feel that your success comes at my expense. I don't feel that the opposite is true either. I believe that if a rising tide is coming up, it lifts all boats, and that my liberation is bound up in yours. Likewise, my struggle is bound up in yours. Okay? So, standing in solidarity with someone else's struggle doesn't threaten me, it actually strengthens me. I think we're in a historic moment when a community is crying out for justice, and in those moments, I am choosing to stand with the oppressed. I also fight against transphobia, ableism, and homophobia, and even though I'm not directly impacted by some of those, I hope that in doing so, I inspire others to fight against sexism, and ageism, and Islamophobia, and xenophobia, and other things that oppress me, and others. I truly believe that the world will be more just and beautiful when we share one another's struggles. But can you tell me why we don't do that? It's easy to turn a blind eye. 
And it's not because we don't necessarily care, it's because we're caught up in our own world, in our own worldview, and we don't want to do anything or touch anything that doesn't have anything to do directly with our lives. But I'm telling you today, it is sort of the butterfly effect, and we see it in so many ways. I, I, I'm always tickled when, and I had a friend, bless her heart, she's as sweet as she could possibly be. And she was telling the story of being at a banquet re recently. And she said, <laughs> she said, I was at a banquet. And it, but this is my friend Linda. She said, I can tell this story. Linda's a uh, 50-some-year-old. She's not sure that far. She didn't give me permission for that. 50-some-year-old. <laughs> Suburban white woman from a good family, sweet as pie, as I said, it gives a lot to a lot of people in so many ways. But she said, you know, I went over to sit purposely with a group of black women that were at the function, and they didn't even speak to me. They weren't very welcoming. I think it's reverse racism. <laughs> I said, Linda, honey, because I love you. Let me tell you, never say those words again. Anybody ever heard that term reverse, reverse racism? And I guess I was thinking to myself, like, how do you reverse like 250 years of slavery, the 90 years of Jim Crow, the 60 years of separate but equal, the 35 years of bad housing policy, and all kinds of messed up war on drugs stuff, and mass incarceration? Like, how do you reverse? Like, tell me how you do that shit. That's what I want to know. I just want to see if I can get a curse word off on a Sunday in a non church environment. And thank you for, for accommodating me. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> I'm, with, I'm, I'm with my people. I found my tribe. <laughs> but think about it for a moment. What should the response be? Because we can't take everything that's happened and throw it away, right? But what can we do about it? What can, how can we fix this? How do we get to this social justice that I'm talking about? And what is our respective role to play? Because after all, aren't we all the same? I, oh, oh, oh. I, I'm gonna try it again. <laughs> after all, aren't we all the same? <laughs> Right, at least it says define same. Are, are, are we all the same? Oh, perhaps we're not. Okay. So how many of you say we are all the same? I just want to say a show of hands. As human beings, come on, are we all the same or what? As human beings, we're all the same, we're all the same, right? Human beings. Somebody says human beings. Why wasn't talking about the dogs, y'all? The human beings are all the same. <laughs> okay, so we're all the same. Okay. Who says we're, we're different as human beings? Some of y'all are trying to be bi and have it both ways. That's not, that's, see, I, I saw you over there. <laughs> Is it not, not surprising in this crowd? Again, I found my people, my tribe, right at home. Okay, so I, I'm going to ask for a couple volunteers. Actually, I actually both not volunteers. I'm going to draft a couple people. I had a chance to meet some folks earlier when I was uh, talking and uh, just getting to know folks, getting donuts and stuff. And I, I wonder if I might be able to pick up my friend Myrna. Myrna, would you mind joining me up here? That's Myrna with an E. Come right up here, sit beside me, love. Actually, to my right, on my right, right over here. This is Myrna. Okay. And I'm going to pick up. Yeah, give a round of applause for Myrna. But I pick them. I need volunteers. 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 I pick them. Volunteer. And I'm going to pick on uh, my friend Ken, who came with me. Ken, do you mind coming up for just a minute? He's like, what in the bloody hell? <laughs> you never know with me. It's my very good friend, Ken Okay. So, I'm going to ask you two to stand in front of me and just stand right beside each other, shoulder to shoulder. Don't worry, the black won't rub off, the white won't rub off. You'll be just fine. <laughs> Look at Ken and Myrna. And I'm gonna come back here and stand. I'm gonna, I'm gonna block your view. You see them? Tell me what you think. What differences do you see? Just yell it out. Older. Older, age. Gender. Gender. Dress. Posture. Posture. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so wait a minute. I, I'm, I'm so confused, right? Because remember, all of you, uh, we're all the same. All lives matter, people. Uh, this, 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 there's some differences here. Yeah, but there's a lot more. 
Oh, let's talk about that. What's in common? Well, first of all, they're wearing the same color. <laughs> all right, Erica. All right, she's good. Okay. What else? They might have earnestness behind their eyes, both of them. Yes. Earnestness. Okay. And Lisa agrees that they're both smiling. They're both smiling. They're both smiling. I don't know, I have to be so comfortable up here and be on the sort of the auction block here. About the same height. Okay, so what about this? We saw some differences, uh, right? But we're all the same inside, right? <laughs> but, but you s uh, <laughs> Brian's upset for the plumbing. <laughs> but, but no, no, no. <laughs> this is this is getting way off the rails here, folks. <laughs> Stick around. Two shows nightly. This is gonna be great. <laughs> right. Okay, so wait a minute. If we're all the same, because you guys, y'all you, you, told me that. We're all the same. We lie. We, we lie. <laughs> this, this, we're, this, we're honest. Well, we forced a choice. But wait a minute. Oh, we're getting somewhere. You guys don't mind staying with me for a little bit longer, do you? Okay. Erica says, but you forced a choice. Did I force a choice? Or was it already apparent? We're not all the same. Skin color's different. Age is different. Ken's way older. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, we're all the same inside. Kumbaya, we're fuzzies. Um, Ken, when you go to the doctor, uh, does your doctor ever check your cervix to make sure you're okay? <laughs> Don't answer that. <laughs> Murder, ever had a bout with prostate cancer? <laughs> Probably not, I'm guessing. Probably not. The point is this. We shy away, and you guys can have a seat. Thank you so much. Give them a big round of applause. I feel like I'm gonna both like run to drinks or something right after this. <laughs> We tell ourselves that we're all the same because it's uncomfortable to talk about things like race. Like, that was one of the last things anybody said. They're like, oh, they have different hair. Uh, eye color is different. We don't want to talk about things that make us uncomfortable. But let me tell you what's uncomfortable with me, and Erica kind of hit, on, hit upon this, when well, you force a choice, but the choice is already there. Anybody ever heard about being colorblind? Have you ever said to somebody, oh, I'm colorblind. How many of you, be honest, I'm watching. How many of you have ever said, and this is not just for black or white people, but I'm colorblind. You've ever said, I'm colorblind. Colorblind, okay. So if you're colorblind, what do you see when you see me? What does that make me? Someone of mixed race. Someone of mixed race. I'm gonna go call both my black parents and tell them. <laughs> Somebody was sniffing. <laughs> We're Americans, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Are we? I would hope so. You'd hope so. Great. So here's what I'm going to do. Since we're all Americans and we're all equal, I would like to have all the people who would like to be Black Americans please stand up. No, no, come, come on. No, 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 no BSing now. We need more black people. We're only 12% of this country's population. <laughs> so can I see the people who would like to be black? I mean, for all equal, it shouldn't be a problem. You don't count. <laughs> I mean, you count. You count. Black lives matter, right? But I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You really pretty. David, why can't you just go with me? You knew where I was going with this, man. Why work with me, people? Work with me. But really. To my white friends in the, in the audience, it's, it's something to think about. If we're all truly equal, if we are a colorblind society, because I believe that to be colorblind and for me to accept that means we both have to be willing to play crazy for a minute. You choose not to see what I am, and I have to go along with it to make you feel comfortable. Right? If we're all equal Americans, not just in documentation in our illustrious constitution, but in application, then what does that mean? So I don't have all day, and I appreciate the time you've given me already. I don't like to leave groups feeling unempowered, disempowered. What I will say is this, and I speak, I know for many millions, probably most, it's a big thing to do because, you know, 
And when I say I'm gonna speak for all black people, I'm no Martin Luther Queen. Um, <laughs> and really this is so interesting, because like how does a guy who's the kid of a Muslim mom and a Catholic dad, and I should tell you that they both have become evangelical born again Christians, so that's been a lot of fun. And, then, <laughs> and when I graduated high school, I went straight to Bible college, because I, I wrote Christmas carols and stuff, I was like, what? So he was born from the, and the okay, let me go learn some of this, because I'm confused. And then, on top of that, Holy crap, or not so, but anyway, get the point. How do we move forward as individuals? Like I said, I don't speak for all black people, but I can guarantee you what most black people in this country are asking for, what Black Lives Matter is all about, is not a denigration of white people. It's not saying you're bad because you have privilege. It is saying what Dr. King wrote, in this letter from a Birmingham jail, and he expressed his deepest disappointment, he said his deepest, most agonizing disappointment was that more white moderates who could stand up didn't. They weren't joining in the struggle. And listen, if there's oppression here or with one group, it can be oppression for other groups. And don't even get me started on how we treat women in this country. And don't you dare be trans. We have a way to go. But I want to give you five simple little tips that will help you. Now listen, now, I have to be careful because every time I talk to a lot of my white liberal friends, and I have a lot of them, honey, they'll take whatever I say. They're, I'm so sorry y'all had it bad. That slave ship was awful. I'm, I'm like, no, don't, don't run up to every black person you see and do that. That's not going to go well for you. <laughs> it's not going to go well for you. Although I'm willing to step back and watch and see what happens, but I'm not going to go well. Five key things. Number one, if you want to help, if you want to get things better in this country, in terms of how we relate to one another and appreciating our differences and being okay with it and not ignoring it, but appreciating it, accepting it. Number one, realize that your part is to ask where you can help and then do it. And sometimes it's really hard when you're in a position of privilege, and we all experience privilege. We all do. Men, we get a lot of privilege in this country, a lot. We all experience privilege. So realize that your part is to ask where you can help and then do it. Number two, share in the struggle with the oppressed once they've engaged you in the process. Number three, don't dictate to an oppressed minority how they go about achieving their liberation. And I know if there are women of a certain age in, in this room, you can appreciate how as femin feminism was on the rise, particularly in the 60s and 70s, and how men wanted to dictate how women got to express their freedom. That's ridiculous. And I told somebody uh, recently, when I'm hurt, you don't get to tell me how loudly to say ouch. You don't get to dictate how much pain I'm in or how I express it. Number four, stop trying to make this about your fragile feelings. Oh. But it wasn't me. I didn't enslave you. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about systems. Systems that have to change. Structures that have to be improved or reformed. Number five, quit trying to compare struggles. Oh my God, don't do that. Well, I grew up poor. Yeah, but your great, great, great grandpappy owned me. I mean, what, what are we doing here? What is this? <laughs> There is a word that is uh, Swahili, and it kind of goes back to what we're talking about, colorblindness. And here's the first step to making a difference. If you can do this one thing, I promise you, we can have a better community, a better city, and a better country. If you can do this one thing, that word is sawubona. Sawubona. And it's a Zulu word that essentially means, we see you. We see you. You ever have a kid act out um, and you just can't figure out why? So often it's because they want the attention. And we deserve it as human beings, that connectedness. We see you. I, if I, anytime I make eye contact with somebody, I acknowledge them. I just do. I speak, I nod, I, wait, I just do. I say hello. 
I just refuse to not do that because I see you. You have value. That word, sabubono, is an invitation to deep witnessing and presence. It's an engagement. And in that engagement, what we're saying is we're going to agree together to respect and appreciate one another. And that is without respect to differences or similarities. You matter. Your life has value. I choose to recognize you. Thank you so much for allowing me this time today. Perhaps I'll come back some other time and talk about owning the pond. Uh, and I will say about that that you know the one thing I'm, that's so important is learn to praise your own pond. Find out what your purpose is, your life is, and do that. You don't have to have other people's approval. And with that, thank you so much. Have a good day. Hey, JJ. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. This is the kind of thing I like to see in this community. Oh, great. Thank Wonderful you. Wonderful to have you. What, what I find most, most curious to my question is listening to Josh Law's talk and talking about being more right. He's talking about how it's that refinement of an answer that makes things more accurate. Mm -hmm. And when you asked if we were all the same, because I'm a geek, the first place that my brain went to was our DNA strip, where, in sim similarly speaking, we have 999987 similar DNA chain. So you can probably give me a more accurate figure, David, but it, it's dramatically accurate. So in that sense, I did think that we were the same. I understand that there are differences. What's the best way to go about describing those differences in a comfortable setting? You know, that's a really tough question for this reason. Um, we don't like to talk about race in this country. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. And we don't have enough safe spaces such as this, quite frankly, to be able to engage in those conversations. And I also will say two other things that sometimes, you know, uh, you don't, as I'm just speaking as an individual, but I don't always feel like I want to educate people on racism. Like, educate your damn self. <laughs> I like, give them all the privilege. Why, why the hell am I teaching? Teach me how bad we do, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, however, <laughs> I'm in a unique position to be able to share sometimes, but I think that it's deconstructing how we have the conversation, JJ, in the sense that we have to be willing to have a starting point. And for me, that starting point is with our shared humanity. I know that sounds really froofy and, and fluffy, but that really is it for me. It is focusing on that 999. Then you can say, well, here's where we're different, and I can appreciate that because that's an understanding of how we're all the same. And that, to me, is a starting point. Hope that's helpful. Thank you, Rashad. Uh, a lot of times in my reading, especially online, which barely constitutes reading, I get that, but. Uh, one encouragement I've heard a lot is uh, stand up and say something when you perceive racism, stand up and say something, but sometimes I admit I hesitate because I'm not sure if I'm helping or if I'm making it worse, if I'm just la adding another loud voice to the conversation. Can, can you provide any kind of guidance on how to know when it's right to jump in and, and kind of take that stand when you see something that you know is wrong, or uh, you know, give some kind of advice on that? That's a beautiful question, and the answer is it's never wrong to jump in when you see something that's unjust. It's never wrong. Um, Byron Rustin, who many of you know, um, was the lead organizer for the March on Washington for Jobs and Equality. We forget that last piece. And Byron had a single principle about protest, and that was that it should be disrupted, that you should be the, the, the pebble in the cogs and so when you see unjust things happening, you should always step in. And I will tell you, uh, and this is probably not the, the, the most accurate and appropriate parallel, sometimes people won't appreciate it. Uh, in my old neighborhood, I live in Columbus Park down in the city market area, and I came home from work one day, there's a video about this posted on my Facebook page, came home from work one day and uh, was meeting my trainer. <clears throat> because you don't get all this by accident. <laughs> and at the end of my block, 
Uh, and I didn't see it. I was unloading my car. My trainer had just pulled up, and he says, oh, look, those guys are fighting now. I've lived in this neighborhood for eight. I've never seen anything close to that. Like, it's galleries and great little restaurants, and uh, all of a sudden, it was a sort of tall black guy and this other big white guy, and lo and behold, it was a 14-year-old kid and this 30, 47-year-old guy. Long story short, the guy saw that the kid was really bad. I have a choice to make. I'm not getting in that. I'm not getting in that. But then how could I not? How could I not? There's never a wrong time. So I don't know if we have time for any more questions or if I've talked them all out, but that's fine with me. Thank you guys so much. You've been great.